Nobody is perfect, and we have all been wrong a time or twenty, however, no matter how wrong we have been, it is highly unlikely that we have ever been as catastrophically wrong as some of the people below. They range from the guy who got himself killed demonstrating an architectural point nobody cared about, to the guy who got hundreds of thousands killed with a series of bad decisions, following our 15 fascinating things about people, who were proven as catastrophically wrong as is humanly possible. Number 15. Charles the Bad lived down to his name. Charles II of Navarre, also known as Charles the Bad was a powerful French magnate, with extensive holdings throughout France. From 1349 he was also the King of Navarre, a small kingdom on the Pyrenees Mountains between France and Spain. He earned the nickname the Bad because of his propensity for intrigues, bad faith dealings, betrayals, dishonesty, and double crosses as he attempted to expand his kingdom at the expense of France and Spain. During the Hundred Years' War, he plotted with the English to betray France, and was arrested and imprisoned by the French King John II when his treachery came to light. Charles escaped from prison in 1357, and began a series of intrigues with a variety of French parties, betraying nearly all one after the other. After John II's death, his successor forced Charles to renounce most of his holdings in France. Number 14. Don't double-cross somebody known as the cruel. In 1378, Charles the Bad was forced to cede nearly all of his remaining French holding, when evidence of new treachery was discovered, it proved that Charles not only planned to again betray France to the English, but plotted to go one better this time, and poison the French king. To the south, Charles' poor reputation was no better in Spain, there, he allied with Peter the Cruel of Castile against Peter IV of Aragon in 1362, he turned around and betrayed Castile the following year, allying with Peter IV against Peter the Cruel, in 1378, Castilian armies invaded Navarre and Charles was forced to flee, out of allies, having betrayed them all Charles was forced to agree to a humiliating treaty, that defanged his kingdom and reduced him and his realm to Castilian clients. Number 13. Karma Catches Up With Charles The Bad Karma caught up with Charles The Bad in a big way in 1387, he came down with an illness that impeded the use of his limbs, and a physician prescribed that he be swaddled, from head to foot in linen cloth steeped in brandy or other spirits of wine, a maid, tasked with securing the swaddling cloth snugly, around the king's body by sewing it in place with yarn, realized when she was done that she had no scissors with which to snip the excess yarn, she decided upon an expedient that ended in catastrophe. Resorting to a common alternate method for thread cutting, the maid reached for a candle to use its flame to burn off a section of yarn, the alcohol-infused cloth caught on fire, and Charles the Bad, tightly swaddled in the burning linen was unable to escape, he suffered horrific burns all over his body, and lingered for two weeks in extreme agony before he finally died. Number 12. An Ungrateful Sibling George Plantagenet, 1st Duke of Clarence is best known for his weird death, it came about after he engaged in a series of ill-advised conspiracies, against his brother King Edward IV of England, George was the younger son of Richard, Duke of York, whose struggle to secure power precipitated the Wars of the Roses, between the houses of York and Lancaster. After his brother broke the Lancastrians at the Battle of Towton in 1461, deposed the Lancastrian King Henry VI, and had himself crowned as Edward IV, George was made Duke of Clarence, the following year, although only 13 years old, he was also made Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, as he grew into early manhood, George idolized and came under the influence of Richard Neville, Earl of Warwick also known as the Kingmaker, George married Neville's daughter in defiance of the king's plans, to marry him into a European royal family to secure a dynastic alliance. Number 11. Siding with a sketchy father-in-law against one's own brother. Neville, the kingmaker had been instrumental in deposing the prior Lancastrian King Henry VI, and replacing him with Edward IV, he eventually fell out with King Edward and deserted to the Lancastrians, George rewarded his brother's earlier generosity with betrayal, took his father-in-law's side and despite being a member of the York family, switched his support to the Lancastrians. With the kingmaker's machinations, George's brother Edward IV was deposed and forced to flee England in 1470, the once deposed Lancastrian King Henry VI was restored to the throne, however, George started to mistrust his father-in-law, the kingmaker and switched back to his brother, Edward IV returned to England in 1471, defeated the Lancastrians in a battle during which the kingmaker was killed and was restored to the throne, he ensured that the twice-deposed Henry VI would trouble him no more by having him murdered, after having already executed Henry's son and sole heir. Number 10. A conspiracy too many turns out to be catastrophic. King Edward IV pardoned his younger brother George, and restored him to royal favor, 
However, George was catastrophically addicted to intrigues and plotting, worse, he was not very good at concealing it and kept getting caught. In 1478, George once again betrayed his elder brother, and was caught plotting against the king. Finally fed up with his wayward sibling, Edward IV ordered George arrested, jailed him in the Tower of London and had him tried for treason, personally conducting the prosecution before Parliament. Edward secured a conviction and a bill of attainder against George, who was condemned to death. On February 18, 1478, George Plantagenet, 1st Duke of Clarence was executed by being dunked into a button or big barrel of Malmsey wine and forcibly held under its surface until he was drowned. Number 9. A Lawyer's Windows Obsession Canadian lawyer Gary Hoy was a respected senior partner at a Toronto law firm. Before going to law school, Hoy had gotten a degree in engineering, and the robustness of modern building techniques was a subject of particular interest to him. He was peculiarly proud of the tensile strength of the windows at his office in the Toronto Dominion Centre, a downtown high-rise and habitually demonstrated the window's sturdiness by body-checking them. As things turned out, it was an ill-advised habit. One evening, Hoy was at a welcoming party being thrown for a group of incoming law student summer interns, in a conference room on the 24th floor, wishing to impress the interns with the office window strength, Hoy sought to demonstrate that they were unbreakable by throwing himself at a glass wall, he had done so many a time before, and always ended up bouncing off harmlessly, not so this time. Number 8. Catastrophe turned Hoy into a celebrity. As Toronto's police put it, at this Friday night party, Mr. Hoy did it again and bounced off the glass the first time, however, he did it a second time and this time crashed right through the middle of the glass, he fell to his death 24 floors below, his unfortunate death, could have been averted had he left window tensile strength testing to the experts, as a structural engineer told the Toronto Star, I don't know of any building code in the world that would allow a 160-pound man, to run up against a glass window and withstand it. Hoy's auto defenestration made the obscure law partner a greater celebrity in death than he had ever been in life, his unusual demise became the basis for sundry urban legends, that were actually based on a true factual foundation, his death was featured in episodes of the TV shows Mythbusters and 1000 Ways to Die, garnered him entries in Snopes and Wikipedia, and won him a 1996 Darwin Award. Number 7. A Tailor with an Obsession Austrian-born French Taylor Franz Reichelt, was fascinated with flight since childhood, after the invention of the airplane, he sought to invent a device that would allow pilots to parachute safely, to the ground should they run into trouble aloft, his efforts were spurred on when in 1911, the Aero Club de France offered a 10,000 franc prize to the first inventor of a successful parachute. Reichelt's design took the form of a suit featuring a cloak with a big silken hood, it weighed about 20 pounds, and had a surface area of around 340 square feet, he tested the design several times, on dummies thrown out of his fifth-floor apartment but without success, so following an inexplicable chain of logic, he decided to test on himself what had failed to work on dummies. Number 6. Substituting oneself for a dummy. Franz Reichelt seemed undaunted by his contraption's repeated test failures, and petitioned the Paris police for permission to test his invention on a dummy from the Eiffel Tower. After securing a permit, he proceeded to drum up interest among journalists and the public to witness the test at 8 a.m. February 4, 1912. On the appointed day, Reichelt arrived wearing his parachute suit, and was met by a crowd of onlookers gathered at the Eiffel Tower, as police cordoned off the drop zone. Accompanied by journalists, he ascended the tower while two film crews positioned themselves, one on the ground to catch the drop from the tower and another at the tower to film the dummy being thrown. People were perplexed however because they could see no dummy, it gradually dawned on them that Reichelt had not brought one, but intended to test his design by jumping off the tower in person. Number 5. Fatal Failure A guard stopped Franz Reichelt, but the inventive tailor convinced him to let him proceed. Friends and journalists also tried to talk him out of it but to no avail, as Reichelt was impervious to good advice. Climbing the stairs, he paused to give the crowd a cheery abiento, before continuing to the tower's first deck. There, as the cameras rolled and people shouted for him to stop, he climbed on a stool placed atop a table adjacent to the guardrail, and jumped at 8.22 a.m. The suit was a flop literally and figuratively, Reichelt fell about 200 feet to his death on the frozen ground below, with an impact that left a six-inch crater and crushed his spine and skull, unbeknownst to him just two days earlier, an American had successfully parachuted 225 feet from the Statute of Liberty, using what would become the standard half-spherical backpack parachute. Number 4. The Last Caliph. Al-Mustavasim Bilal was the last ruler of the Abbasid Caliphate, 
and Islam's last caliph, a weak ruler ruling a weak rump of what had once been a mighty empire, al Mustafasim was surrounded by ineffectual advisors who offered conflicting advice, when the Mongols demanded his submission, he rejected the demands, ignoring some and answering others with bluster and empty threats, but failed to prepare adequate defenses against what was sure to follow such rejection. The Mongols first erupted into the Islamic world in the 1220s, when Genghis Khan destroyed the Cramian Empire, and conquered as far west as western Persia up to the edges of Mesopotamia, that outburst was followed by a decades-long relative lull, as far as the Middle East, and the Islamic world were concerned. During that stretch, the Mongols directed their energies elsewhere against China, Kievan Rus, Eastern Europe, and internal squabbles amongst themselves. Number 3. Misreading the Situation the lull ended in the 1250s when a new Mongol ruler, Genghis Khan's grandson Monk, turned his attention to the Middle East and sent his brother, Halaku to assert Mongol power over the region. Halaku began by first destroying the assassins, a murderous cult led by a shadowy mystic known as the Old Man of the Mountain. They operated out of a string of mountain fortresses, from which they terrorized the Middle East for over a century and a half. Completing that task by 1256, Halaku turned his attention to the Abbasid Caliphate, based in Baghdad, he ordered its caliph, al Mustafasim, to submit to Mongol suzerainty and pay tribute. The caliph made a catastrophic mistake by misreading the situation, overestimating his own power and influence and underestimating the Mongols' might. Number 2. Pride without power. The Abbasids had once been a powerful dynasty that had ruled the world's largest, strongest, and most prosperous empire, however, they were centuries removed from their heyday by the time al Mustafasim became caliph. By the 1250s, the Abbasid Caliphate's sway did not stretch far beyond Baghdad, as to the caliphs they had been reduced to mostly ceremonial figureheads, puppets of Turkish or Persian sultans wielding real power, and acting in their name. What Caliph al Mustafasim s still had was a remnant of spiritual and moral authority, and enough pride to refuse Halaku's summons to submit. Number 1. The Caliph discovers just how catastrophically wrong he had been. Al Mustafasim was not prepared to face the Mongols who had conquered bigger and tougher opponents than the small rump, which still remained to the Abbasid Caliphate. However, al Mustafasim believed that the Mongols would not be able to seize Baghdad, and that if the city was endangered, the Islamic world would rush to its aid, he turned out to be catastrophically wrong. Halaku marched on Baghdad, the Islamic world did not rush to its aid and after a 12-day siege, the city fell, the Mongols sacked Baghdad, massacred its inhabitants burned its vast libraries, and put the city to the torch, al Mustafasim was captured, but the Mongols had a taboo against spilling royal blood, so they had him executed by rolling him in a carpet, over which their army rode when it marched off to further conquests, their horses trampling the last caliph to death. <laughs>